Let's bring in uh, Justin Dunk from Three Down Nation. Been busy guy, Justin. How are you, my buddy? Doing well. Patient for you, dude. I've been waiting through this hockey talk, which I understand has to come first. But what's going on in the CFL, my man? Yeah, well, let's get into it because uh, that's our poll question today. And I'll just ask you right off the hop. Our, uh, our poll question um, is for Key Auto Group. Um, who's winning CFL free agency, or more specifically, the negotiation period? Um, there's a lot of candidates out there. A lot of viewers of this show might think it's the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, deservedly so. Um, but who do you have winning the CFL free agent window so far? You know, I'll take this one a bit of a different way and probably won't go with any of your choices in this actual answer box, so to speak. But, you know, I think back to last year, everybody, you know, except for Cody Fajardo and a couple other pieces, were leaving the Montreal Alouettes. Everybody had them last in the power rankings. They had no chance. They were going to be the worst team in the CFL, buddy. But then what happened? They won the Grey Cup. So I think in actuality, what CFL free agency has become is a way to add pieces here or there, ideally retain your pieces like what the Blue Bombers have done with at least a couple of big name players in terms of Canadian running back Brady Oliveira and all-star receiver Dalton Schoen. But when you talk about teams who have won free agency, like how many times in the recent past since you know we've been in this profession, have we seen the team that wins free agency gone on to win the Grey Cup. It's about culture. It's about player development. It's about scouting and retaining those players that can lead you to the promised land. So I'm not going to answer the question. I'll put out there, I guess I'm saying other. Yeah. Well, no, and, and that's a good point because culture and stuff matters so much more. And we, we're coming up to CF, or, uh, sorry, NHL trade deadline here in a number of weeks, and it's the same thing, right? Making moves and making a splash here and there doesn't necessarily create culture. But it does seem, if we want to talk about Saskatchewan for a second, that Corey Mace is building something, um, that maybe some players want to go to Saskatchewan again. And it, it, is that what we're seeing around the league? I think there's definitely a renewed energy there with what they're doing in Saskatchewan. Mace, obviously, and Trevor Harris being healthy and him giving them a little bit of cap room to work with, I certainly think help this situation. And they go out and get him a premier running back in the prime of his career in A.J. Ouellette. He painted his Thor hammer green. He's ready to rock out there in Ryderville. I think the fans are absolutely going to love this guy. And there was a relationship there between Ouellette and Mace from their time together with the Toronto Argonauts. And Ouellette is familiar with that stadium and likes Playing there, he scored two touchdowns in the Argonauts Grey Cup win there over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the 109th edition. So I really like that signing. Some people might say, well, you maybe shouldn't be spending on running backs, but you know, Jamal Morrow wasn't a guy that was kind of doing these kind of things that Ulek can do. He runs with power, so physical, ultra-athletic. He was tied for the CFL lead in 20-plus yard runs last year with 10 of those. And then you look at the defensive side of the ball. He goes out and gets Jameer Thurman, who's a guy that he spent time with in Calgary together in that defense with the Stampeders to lead his defense, as we've just reported at 3downnation.com. The team has also agreed to terms with Canadian linebacker Adam O'Claire. I think he'll have an opportunity to start at that weak side or will linebacker spot. And they have been active. They were in on Jamal Peters, but didn't necessarily want to pay that price tag that it would take to get him. I think they did have some interest on Brandon Barlow, but he got around $200,000 on his agreement with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. So the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are spending their money selectively, and I would say at this point, smartly. Well, that's, yeah. Um, speaking of money, you know, one of the lead stories that, you know, you kind of talked about was Brady Oliveira and the money left on the table. But for Winnipeg to lock up Dalton Schoen and Brady Oliveira, there's a lot of Winnipeg viewers in our chat right now that are pretty happy and think, hey, it's a minor miracle. They got both those guys back, and they feel like because of that, Winnipeg's winning free agency, and they should be pretty excited. Definitely. Now, the guy that I left out, 
talking about the Rough Riders, that was the jewel of their free agent class was Jamarcus Hardrick, the offensive tackle. They pay to get him to leave Winnipeg, $230,000, $120,000 just to sign that contract, which could be the biggest signing bonus as we go along here in free agency. Matthew Betts might have a chance to beat it. Perhaps Tim White will have to monitor that situation in the race for the biggest signing bonus. But Hardrick was a big loss for the Blue Bombers, but that move allowed them to have the financial flexibility under the salary cap to sign Canadian running back Brody, Brady Olivier, excuse me, for $230,000 in 2024 and $240,000 in 2025 and re-sign Dalton Schoen for a similar range of money. I believe it's around $230,000 in 2024. So if you're a Winnipeg Blue Bombers fan, what would you rather have? A premier offensive tackle to protect Zach Caleros or two star offensive players, a guy in shown that Caleros often looks to in the end zone, yes, but especially in those critical second down situations. And Oliveira, who had one of the best running backs ever, I don't care about his passport, for a season in CFL history and arguably one of the best closers, if not the best closer, I think right now in the CFL in terms of closing out football games, which the Blue Bombers are leading. Yeah, really important. Really, really important. Yeah. Well, um, but Patrolman Pete in Winnipeg, as we pick up where we left off, says, I'd be curious to know Justin's thoughts on the Bomber O-line now that Hardrick is gone and the big free agent dollars have been spent. And we touched on it a bit, but um, where are they at with their offensive line and what's the outlook ahead of the season? That right tackle spot is going to be something that they're going to have to figure out as they go here. Drew Richmond has retired. That was a guy who was on a rookie contract that they had been developing. He wanted more money if he was going to step up and be the starter, and rightfully so, but you kind of got to prove it as well. So he decides to move on from professional football. One guy that I think could potentially be a fit from an experience standpoint is Trayvon Tate. He played Left tackle for the Argos last year for 10 games, obviously protecting the blind side of Chad Kelly. Still in his late 20s, I think has some upside. I would imagine as this process goes along that that could be one of the ideas that's bandied about in the Winnipeg front office there. And if they're not going to go that route, there's not really many other proven veteran American tackles on the market. So perhaps they think about going Canadian at that right tackle spot, or they go through the scouting and draft process and try to identify a couple of players that can compete to start at that position vacated by Hardrick going to Saskatchewan. Yeah, something we'll be following, and I know Winnipeg fans will be following um, as well quite a bit. Um, So I want to get this a little more, and we kind of talked just, brief though or you know kind of glazed over it but david in winnipeg says he just saw dunk's tweet saying brady turned down seven hundred and seventy thousand and five hundred and fifty thousand. that's wild with the fire emoji so uh <laughs> explain that because that those are big numbers in the cfl it was pretty wild the hamilton tiger cats came fast and furious at brady Oliveira when the negotiating window or what do we want to call it legal tampering window i think is probably more apt to call it when it actually came open Oliveira talked to ceo scott mitchell general manager ed hervey head coach scott milanovic and they presented him and his agent with an offer for two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a year all in what the CFL would term hard money. It's not quite guaranteed money, but if you're going to be on the roster, even if you get hurt, you're probably going to earn that money. So $275,000 per year on a two-year contract. Now, that made Brady at least think a little bit. And then the BC Lions came to the table and presented an offer worth $770,000 over three years, sort of stepping up from $250,000 I think it was 256 and 262 approximately through those three years. And Oliveira's camp felt like there could have been room for negotiation there based on Hamilton's offer to push that even higher, over 800,000 through those three years. The Lions were kind of trying to hit him in the fields. His girlfriend, Alex Blumberg, is from out in the West Coast. Her family is still there. So there was some thought to that. But When it was all said and done, Oliveira wanted to be in Winnipeg. He felt like he had some unfinished business, so he takes a contract worth 
$470,000 over two years, 230 and 240, and then also has the chance to make off-field money there in Winnipeg. He's a hometown boy, so I think there's going to be some decent cash to be made there off the field, but he definitely took a hometown discount to stay in Winnipeg, proving that it wasn't all about the money for Oliveira. Wild. Yeah, I can only imagine, you know, how that situation went down and be tough, you know, when you're looking at all that money and especially when you're looking at your your partner being from there too. But here's something that came out today from the National Post I thought was really interesting and I wanted to see if this has any relevance to the CFL. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But it's it's it goes back to hockey. Maple Leafs captain John Tavares fighting with the Canada Revenue Agency. I don't know if you saw this. Over 8 million dollars an $8 million tax bill that JT has to pay. <laughs> Tavares says he should owe 15% on the $15.3 million signing bonus he received when he signed with the Leafs uh, just uh, under six years ago. The CRA says the bonus should be taxed at 38%. Now, there is a clause in, you know, in the tax, uh, lower tax rate. There's a, a, um, a line in there for inducements, bonuses paid to athletes, actors, artists, musicians that should have them taxed at a lower rate for those things, like a signing bonus, 15%. CRA thinks it should be 38%. And now there's a lot of talk about this decision could have a big impact over future free agents deciding to sign in Canada. Could this be something that has any spill-off effect to the Canadian Football League when we think about players signing in the CFL versus the USFL or the UFL? That could be massive. And, man... Does the CRA not already get enough money? Like, really? And they're going to stop these professional athletes potentially wanting to come and play in Canada? Maybe not so much for the CFL, but the NHL and the NBA and the MLB? Like, you know, what are we talking about here? Come on, man. We're taxed enough as it is. I don't want to get too political with it, but that could have an effect, especially on Canadian CFL players. Right now in the CFL, if you're an American and you get a signing bonus, you are taxed at a lower rate. That's why you see a lot of Americans redoing their deals. Trevor Harris is a perfect example of this, excuse me, for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, turned his roster bonus into a signing bonus and redid his contract for 2024 because he ultimately nets more money after taxes and gives the riders some cap release. That is not the case, though, for Canadian players in the CFL. So I think that this situation you're describing with John Tavares, Johnny T, could have an impact that trickles down to the CFL. Interesting. It'll be something worth following as he goes through that uh, in a battle with, with the CRA. And I know you get the other side that says, well, it's millionaires fighting over millions, boo-hoo, and, you know, um, not a real problem. But it is. It, it could affect well, his your money, man. Team. Nobody wants to give yeah. money away, you know. It affects how much, you know how much your tickets cost, all the rest of it. So it's something worth following for sure. Okay, so before we close the book on the CFL, so far, your favorite signing? Or what's been kind of your favorite move so far? Oh, dude, there's been so many things that have happened. I'm trying to keep everything straight. But to be quite honest, the one that I was most excited about and wanted to report and did report was AJ Ouellette going to the Rough Riders. I just feel like it's such a perfect fit. He's kind of from this small town in Ohio, has grinded his way through the CFL ranks, and is this guy that looks like a superhero, Thor or whatever else you want to call him. I just think it's such a perfect culture fit for him to go to Regina and then also as a player in the locker room with Corey Mace, helping be part of that transition, the leadership group potentially there in installing the kind of culture that Corey Mace wants. So I think that Ouellette was my favorite one for that reason, but there's so much that has gone on that my answer you know, might change in a week or two here once I've digested it all. But right now, Ouellette's the front runner. I love it. Yeah, and the, the green Thor hammers. Um, what a great you know, marketing fit. He fits. I think. I think it's going to be fun. And the you you just see with with so much that's happened in that province, the culture is shifting, and we're seeing the the needle move uh, on the culture meter, and uh, that can't be anything but good. I know they're excited in Saskatchewan. Okay, um, I don't know how much you've even been thinking about the Super Bowl because you've been breaking all the news in the Canadian Football League and this negotiation period 
But um, how much are you following Super Bowl? How much do you wish you were in Vegas? And uh, what's got your attention so far? <laughs> Man, I wish I was in Vegas. There were some plans to be there, but broke my wrist, dude. You know, I'm healing from it anyways. Bigger, better things in the future. But I've been following Super Bowl for sure, you know, and I think to have a neat tie-in here on both sides, Rock Purdy was once on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers negotiation list, and him being Mr. Irrelevant, the last pick in the NFL draft in his year, there was probably a thought that maybe one day he would end up in the CFL, and you wonder how good he could have been up here. But obviously now he's starring for the San Francisco 49ers. And on the other side, Patrick Mahomes, too, at one time was on a CFL negotiation list as well. I believe it was the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I would have to double check some of my notes. So that's intriguing. And then of course you have the tie in Zach Caleros, somewhat jokingly, one of the new friends of Taylor Swift. He was called roommates with Travis Kelsey. Claros doesn't seem like he wants to say much about it publicly, but then there was Kelsey on Super Bowl media night there talking about his boy Zip. That's his nickname for him. And then I asked Caleros about it. He actually explained how the nickname came to be. And it was because I think he had a cousin that played for the Akron Zips. And he was always wearing their gear. So Kelsey called him Zip. And I guess that stuck for a while now. Some unique CFL kind of tie-ins there. Well, it's pretty good. Like, I I just pulled up Bet Regal's um, all the Super Bowl bets. And, you know, 49ers still favored by two going into the game. Um, But I flipped over to the prop bets, and there's this special uh, Super Bowl slash Grammy specials, and you know who's at the top of that with uh, (laughs) T-Swift. So I scroll down here, and this is an interesting one that you can bet on. T-Swift, first person shown next to in the Super Bowl. So who's she sitting next to or who's she standing next to? At the top of that list is Brittany Mahomes at plus 100. Um, Donna Kelsey is there, Jason Kelsey. Um, Ed Kelsey, keep scrolling down. Plus three, plus 3,300 is Mike Tyson. I don't know how he made the list, but Mike Tyson may be in the booth. I'm not seeing Zach Caleros on here as a betting option, but uh, should we be taking a flyer that she might be next to Zach Calero? <laughs> I don't think that that is going to be the case, but how are they describing next to? Like, they have to be right beside her. What if they're behind her? Because we've seen so many shots this season, and she's at the Chiefs games in these fancy suites with Brittany Mahomes right beside her, or Donnie Kel- Donna Kelsey, excuse me, right beside her, or Jason Kelsey. Is Jason Kelsey on that list? How's he not on that list? Oh, yeah. Jason Kelsey's plus 500. He's the third most, uh, third highest odds on that list. I'd love to see. The Chiefs win the Super Bowl, and a shirtless Jason Kelsey just gives a big old bear hug to T. Swift on the field. Those images, I know she goes viral for whatever she does anyways, but would be amazing to see. Oh, my gosh. And I keep scrolling down. You know, there's bets now. Will Will Swift mention the Chiefs and Kelsey at her last Tokyo show before the Super Bowl? Yes, no. Um, And... The disclaimers on the bottom of this are pretty good, too. Management decision is final. If It's void if Taylor Swift does not attend the Super Bowl. From kickoff to the final whistle, halftime and commercials don't count. CBS broadcast only. So uh, um, it is going to be a lot of fun, and I think there's going to be a lot of money. Um, how about this? Taylor Swift, primary color of her top coming off the plane. Not even in the stadium. <laughs> It's pretty nuts. (laughs) Pretty nuts. So Patrick Mahomes, fourth Super Bowl, 28 years old. Um, All the comparisons to Tom Brady. Where are you putting Patrick Mahomes in terms of legacy and his place in history at this point in his career? At this point, you would have to say he's a surefire Hall of Famer. And if he continues on his current trajectory, he's going to be right there with Tom Brady as arguably the greatest of all time. Now he's going to have to get the amount of rings that Brady has. And that's going to be difficult to continue to do with the pace that he's been playing at. But I do think that it's a possibility. Like, look at how this Chiefs season has played out. I don't think there would be a lot of people that felt like the Chiefs would have made the Super Bowl, but they figured it out and arguably played their best offensive football 
in the playoffs to get to this Super Bowl for Patrick Mahomes. The guy is just a winner. And think of the quarterbacks in the AFC, my man, that he's had to go through and consistently beat all of these years to get to his fourth Super Bowl. Of course, he lost to Tom Brady in the Super Bowl and has lost to Tom Brady in the playoffs. But other than one game against Joe Burrow, this guy has owned the AFC and has been so dynamic in these situations that are pressure packed and it makes it look so easy. But people, it's not that easy to run around from these big guys and continue to make plays and take the hits that he does. It's unbelievable what he's doing. And I do think he has the chance. It's going to take a lot to win more than Brady, but that is a long way down this road. You got it. I mean, he's doing everything that he can and he has a hall of fame career already. But that was always the Tom Brady book. Brady had a Hall of Fame career, a little break, and then another Hall of Fame career. So Mahomes will have to do that second act, I think, to match Tom, right? Definitely. And I think he's kind of just like continuing, which gives him the chance maybe to win more than Brady. But that middle part that you're talking about there, that kind of lull where he didn't win a Super Bowl for a while, even though he was in one and the Giants upset them a couple times, shows you that it's difficult. It's not easy. But then people just start to expect that you're going to be there every single year. But it's not that easy. And we're talking about inches sometimes defining legacies. To me, that's something that is so interesting, right? You look at the San Francisco 49ers. If Brandon Ayuk doesn't make a crazy catch that ricochets around, against the Detroit Lions, you could argue they're probably not in the Super Bowl. So these small things that Mahomes had go his way or helped go his way has helped the Chiefs get here. Obviously, it's a great team, very young defense. I like what Steve Spagnuolo has done with that unit, coaching those guys up. But to get here, I think you do have to have some things go your way along with being really good. It'll be fun to watch, no doubt. Man, time goes by fast, but I appreciate it, man. And uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, buddy. See you, dude.